Hey there, this is Pastor Cassie. Thanks for listening to our messages online. At Sage Hills, we prioritize lifting high the name of Jesus and also being rooted in His Word. Real quick, we would love it if you would take a moment and download the Sage Hills app. It's the easiest way to listen and to share these messages. It's also the easiest way for you to stay connected with everything happening here. We pray that the message that you hear out of this house is not only anchored in God's Word, but that it would create a hunger for you to be in God's Word. Let's join in now on this week's message. It was, it was really a struggle and at that point decided that Keith and I needed to separate. And last year um, I moved out for a couple months. Um, I was going to lose my family and my wife. In my early teens I was introduced to alcohol and it just became a part of my life. Uh, anything that ever happened in my life I just drank to deal with it and never ever uh, developed any coping skills. I've saw several different counselors, always tried different exercise programs, eating programs. He could never really get healed from it. Watched him read, watch him restart on Mondays. All of them help in a way, but you're never gonna get over addiction until you completely surrender to God. So I moved to Wenatchee in 2009 with my two girls and we started coming to um, Sage Hills, which was the Free Methodist Church. Um, and shortly after, met Keith, and we continued to attend church here on and off. We raised our kids together. We um, both lost our dads to cancer. We had our house burn in a wildfire. Um, we rebuilt that house. After all of those tragedies, um, we grew a lot closer to God. So all through my years of drinking, it, um, I always wanted to hide it from basically the public, friends, family, co-workers. I was always able to perform my job and just didn't want anybody judging me because of it. During all that time, I, I continued to have my faith. I knew who Keith is at his core. I knew who he is in his heart. I know how much he loves God. And yet the only thing that I needed to know is that Jesus could save both of us. And I just kept praying. Jesus wants the Holy Spirit to flow through us and that there can be certain blocks. I started to understand that the addiction that was in our family was one of those blocks because I was more focused on the addiction and the problems than I was on Jesus' word and at that point decided that Keith and I needed to separate. And it was extremely painful. I knew I needed a spiritual connection and I just wasn't sure where to get it. Eventually it led me to a, a rooted group with a few uh, other men of the church. My ego just kept getting in the way. Every time I thought I was getting a little bit closer, my ego would come back. Until one night, I just had enough. I had the most anguish, exhilarating moment of my life all in one. And then I finally just said, God, here I am. And dropped to my knees crying and just stripped my soul naked and said, please take this nasty disease and just get rid of it. It's like I instantly got this this total weight lifted off of me. Like I knew then I was going to be okay. Every day since then, it's just progressively gotten better. I met with Pastor Mike a couple times on my own, and um, at that time, still with my pride and ego in the way, I didn't really catch everything that he was trying to teach me. And then after the miracle that God gave me, we went back in as a couple, and uh, it was like night and day that I completely understood what he was trying to tell me. I'm very fortunate that Kristen has been so patient and loving through this whole process. I'm very thankful for that. And like I said earlier, I grew up with <laughs> men don't cry. Well, I cry more now, I do, now as a man than I did as a baby, so <laughs> I'd rather be God's man than a man's man's. Now I see how it's really simple that 
the meaning to life is to serve God with a joyous heart. And I mean, that's it. There's so many things that fall underneath that umbrella, but ultimately that's what we're here for. I was dead in my addiction. And thanks to Jesus, through His Spirit, He brought me back to life. I've been a pastor for about 23 years, and I've seen several different people caught up in different types of addictions. But being with Keith and Kristen over the years, I would share with you, I've never seen someone so steeped in addiction that they couldn't see the way out. And that was Keith's story. Before us today is Easter Sunday, and the question I pose to you is this, what does it take? What changes an addict to a son of God. What does that? And I would pose to you today, Easter is what does that. The celebration of the death, resurrection, the burial of Jesus on the third day rises again. The fact that we have a living hope, it takes a living hope to set an addict free. And I'm here to share with you today, friends. We have living hope in Jesus Christ. And I want to invite you into that beautiful, wonderful mystery of a resurrected Jesus that longs to be in relationship with you today. So I want to tell you the Easter story. And the question I want us to continue to ponder about the Easter story is what is so good about Easter? So here at Sage Hills Church, we have this tradition. Uh, in the beginning of our services, when I begin to read the Word of God, I invite you to stand to your feet out of reverence for God's word. And I'd ask you to do that at this time. If you're able, stand to your feet. We do that to call ourselves to attention to this book. We believe that this book is more than just, uh, it's, it's way better than Dr. Seuss or uh, Harry whatever. Like it's way better than all of those books. This is the living, breathing word of God. And we have this saying that we do. We call it the Sagil's Liturgy, where I will hold up this Bible. I'll say, this is the word of God. And your part is to say, let's get after it together. Now, even if you're not a Christian and you're just here, I'm going to ask you to fully participate in this morning. Just for a moment, just allow yourself to experience the power of Easter. Participate with the things that we do. And I promise you, this will not be the worst thing you do this week. I I promise you, you're going to have a great time together. So let's do this together right now. This is the word of God. Good job. I'll read to you the, the Easter narrative from Luke 24, 1 through 8. <clears throat> On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Someone say Amen. amen. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, they bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Very important question. Let me read that again. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day raised again. Then they remembered his words. Let's pray together. Father, today we want to thank you for your word. And God, we do ask that you would speak to us through it. Lord, all of us have come to church today for different reasons, Lord. But for those of us in the room that need to hear this Easter message, I pray that you don't allow anything to stand in the way of it. Not the person sitting next to them, not what they have to do tomorrow, not the fact that their NCAA bracket blew up. Lord, I just pray your blessings over the church today so we can hear and experience the fullness of what Easter offers all of us. Lord, some of us haven't been in church in a long time. <laughs> Lord, some of us have turned our backs and we need to rededicate. We need to re-up. Lord, may the Easter message be fresh today in the hearts and minds of people. Holy Spirit of God, have your way. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said together? Amen. Amen. Before you're seated, turn to your neighbor, give him a high five and say, he is risen. And then let's grab a seat together. Come on, say it. He is risen. <clears throat> Come on. So ever since last Easter Sunday, 
I began preparing for this Easter Sunday. Someone asked me a while back, uh, how soon do you start preparing your Easter message? I will begin to prepare my Easter message for next year, right after third service this year, because I begin to reflect on what God does and what he might want to do next time. And what I began to ponder, the question I began to ponder last Easter was, what is it about Easter that is so special to me? Why is it that right after Palm Sunday, I begin to get this bubbling in my soul, this holy anticipation, this excitement that is running through my veins. What is it? Is it the amount of baptisms? And every Easter, there's a whole bunch of baptisms. This Easter at Sage Hills Church, we're going to baptize over 80 people, which we say, praise the Lord for that. That's incredible. What a mighty God we serve. Is it the fact that we get to be together with all our friends and family, that our college students are home and we get to worship the Lord together? Is that it? And I said, yeah, that's, that's probably part of it. Is it the new life in Jesus? Yes, that's probably part of it. But I'll share with you something even greater than that is why I get so excited about Easter. I came to this conclusion a few years ago, friends. And I share this story often, so it might not be new to all of you, but about four years ago on Easter Sunday, we had just baptized like 40 people. I was walking out of this church like, oh my God, I was so full of the Lord, so grateful for what I get to do. And we have this family tradition. We go celebrate Easter with friends that are like family to us. And I was excited to go hang out with them at their house and celebrate together and reflect on what God has done. But Miss Cassie, that's my wife, she asked me to, Stop by Safeway on my way home. I was such a good husband. I said yes, and I went. Take notes, gentlemen. <laughs> and when I walked in, this lady approached me in the produce aisle, and she said, Pastor Mike. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, wasn't that awesome? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it was awesome. It was incredible. She goes, what about the baptisms? I'm like, yeah. I was just so jacked and so excited and so like, yes. And then when she began to walk away after we had our moment and we're just like so celebratory, she walked away. And I said, hey, sister. She's like, yeah. I said, he is risen. And she said, I sure hope so. <laughs> you ever had those moments where like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Friends, really quick, he is risen. I wanted to make sure you knew the answer in case I see you after church today. You see, for that woman, her response to Easter, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe she was being sarcastic, which is my love language, but here, maybe, whatever it might be, Many people approach Easter with a hope so. And the reason why Easter is so special to me is I don't hope so about Easter. I know so about Easter. I serve a resurrected Jesus. And every Easter, I'm reminded of three things that I want to share with you today that are going to help you move from hope so to know so and leave here full of the goodness of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Are you ready, church? The first thing that I love about Easter is every single Easter, I'm reminded that Easter confirms Christ's identity. I'll say it again. Easter confirms Christ's identity. Uh, if you come to St. Joe's Church, you know this, but if you don't, I'll just share with you. Everything we do at this church is about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. It is all for him. You're like, why do you serve donuts? Jesus loves donuts, I think. <laughs> why do we have a playground? Jesus. Why do we have a children's ministry? Jesus. Why do we preach the Bible? Jesus. Why do we worship? Jesus. It is all about Jesus. Every 52 weeks a year, this church preaches Jesus. Jesus. And on one of those weeks, it's good to have the reminder that Jesus is actually who he says he is. At the core of Christianity is this belief, friends, that I don't hope so or that I know so, that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. He's the only one to ever achieve both titles, fully God 
and fully man. This is who Jesus is. And so Easter, every Easter, if Christ's identity is confirmed through Easter, it has to confirm two identities. First, that he was fully man, and next, that he is fully God. So let's think about how Easter confirms that he is fully man. I love what the Apostle Paul says. And by the way, next week we're starting a brand new series in the book of Romans. We're going to spend the better part of a year going through the book of Romans, learning about the gospel, look at, learning about righteousness. And I encourage you to join us for every part of that you can possibly be. I promise your faith will grow. But I love the way the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And next Sunday, this is the text that we'll be preaching from. We'll get even deeper into it. It goes this way. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and his holy scriptures, Regarding his son, that's Jesus, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So how do we know that Jesus was fully a man? Well, Paul says a great way to know whether or not a Hebrew was actually a real person is to check the genealogy. Check the genealogy. That's why in both the book of Matthew and the book of Luke, there are these long genealogies that begin with David or someone from the Old Testament and take us all the way to the man of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus was not fiction. He's not fable. He's not a made-up story. He's more than just a bedtime story. Jesus is a real person. Friends, I'm going to tell you something that's not controversial. If you disagree with me, you're wrong. Okay, here it goes. Ready? Ready? Jesus is a fact. He's a fact. He's a real person. Friends, I've been, to, I've been to Israel. I went to Jerusalem. I read the census. His name is on it. Mother named Mary, later adopted by a man named Joseph. Jesus is a fact. And Easter reminds me of the fact of Jesus. But what's the big deal, right? Like, I mean... All of us are fully people too. We have mamas and daddies. Like, like what, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this Jesus was not just a man. This Jesus was God's Messiah. And how do I know that? Well, I know that very simply. Number one, this man who was born was not born or conceived by natural means. Luke chapter 1 one night the angel Gabriel appeared to a virgin who was pledged to be married to a man and said, greetings, you who are highly favored in the eyes of the Lord. Now friends, this week if you get a knock at your door and it's the angel Gabriel and he begins his talk to you by saying, greetings, you who are highly favored in the eyes of the Lord, it's okay to be afraid. Because what happens next is the Holy Spirit of God overshadows this young teenage girl. And because of her obedience, because she says to the angel, may it be to me as you have said, the word of God, Jesus, the promised Messiah that only existed on the words of a page in a temple. That word became flesh inside of Mary, not by naturally me natural means. She was uh, Jesus was immaculately conceived in the womb of a virgin. And when when he was born, all of heaven rejoiced because the Messiah had been born. That word put on flesh, he made his dwelling among us. And we have seen the glory, the glory of the one and only. And Easter confirms his identity, fully God, yet fully man. How else does Easter confirm his identity as fully God? Well, here's a, here's a, here's a spoiler alert, friends. Jesus, three times in the Gospel of Mark, three times predicts. I will be crucified, I will be buried, I will be raised again. And I don't know about you, I've never heard anyone be able to guess all three of those things and get it right. I tell my kids all the time, you are going to find people that question some of the things that are written in this book. And by the way, they're wrong. I'll correct those later. You're going to find reasons in life to doubt. But if anybody can predict their death, burial, and resurrection, you can feel free to follow that person. 
Because only one can do that. Only one was found worthy to be crucified, to be buried, to be rose again through the power of the Holy Spirit. That one is Jesus, and Jesus is a fact. And why I love Easter is it reminds me of who Jesus is. That Jesus is who he says he is, and he'll do what he says he'll do. What hope does a friend like Keith have? Stuck in addiction, upside down. Listen, we prayed, friends. Keith and Kristen and I pray. Kristen came to my office many times. We sought the Lord in prayer to break that addiction over and over again. One day Keith encountered Jesus and it changed everything because he is alive, my friends. He is active and willing and able to pull you out of any darkness. This is Jesus, friends. Someone asked me this morning, are you excited about church? I'm excited about church. Someone says, is it tough to preach Easter? I said, if it's tough to preach Easter, the pastor ought to find another job. This is the gospel, friends. This is the life-changing gospel. And none of you in this room are too cool to hear it. None of you are too wealthy, too successful, or too broke to hear it. Jesus Christ suffered and died, and Easter confirms the fact that this one who was fully man is fully God. His name is Jesus, and you get to serve him today. So number one, it confirms his identity. Number two, even better news, friends, it cancels sin's penalty. Every Easter, I am keenly aware of the fact that I am in need of the grace that Calvary's Hill promises. A lot of you come to church and you were raised in a church and you come here every Easter and you, you come to listen to the pastor and you've been bought into this rule that the guy behind the pulpit is the one that has it all together. I got news for you. I'm a mess. And if it wasn't for the message of Easter, that Christ died for the ungodly, that when I was still a center, sinner, Christ died. If it wasn't for the message that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, I would still be dead in my transgressions. But God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, found a 13-year-old boy so wrapped up in depression, so insecure, so broken, so lost, contemplating whether or not his life had any meaning at all. God reached into the pit of that 13-year-old's life, showed him Jesus, and that 13-year-old boy found Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus found him. And because he found him, I have given my life. No, I'm not perfect, still all messed up. But here's the reality. Jesus is the best at taking broken things and putting them back together. Easter cancels sin's penalty, friends. And today, you can have your sin forgiven. And it doesn't come by anything that you can do or say. A lot of you come to Easter every year and you say, listen, I hear Pastor Mike for the last nine years stand behind the pulpit and he calls people to baptism. He calls people to salvation. And he goes, and you say to yourself, I have every intention of doing that one day. But first, I gotta get my ducks in a row. I gotta get my life right. It's like the people who clean their house before the house cleaner comes over. It's like the person who says, I'm gonna get in shape before I start going to the gym. <laughs> Friends, I'm telling you, any attempt to save yourself is like putting lipstick on a pig, cologne on a corpse. You don't need to fix yourself. Christianity is not behavior modification. It's life alteration. And you can't alter your own life. You need a savior just like me. It's like the great theologian Dr. Phil once said. <laughs> if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. You can't dig yourself out of this hole. You need what I need. We need Easter's message to cancel our sin. Only Jesus can. Friends, my friend Keith, he could not fix his alcohol addiction, but Jesus can. Your marriage can't be fixed by human hands. Jesus can. Your sickness, your disease, your brokenness, your lostness can't be fixed by human hands, but Jesus can. He can do it. I've seen him do it for 23 years. I've seen thousands of people lost, thousands of people found. I've seen thousands of people in those baptisms waters, and now I see thousands of people who stand right before the Father because of the Son. Jesus can, friends. And we've got to remember that today. Jesus can one of the most powerful verses in the entirety of the New Testament. We'll talk about this at length next week in Romans chapter one. It begins this way. It says, Paul, 
a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. There is so much gospel message in that one verse if you know who Paul was before Jesus. Paul was a slave to sin. He was the number one terrorist against the church of Jesus Christ, the real one. But one day on a road trip, on a journey to go persecute and kill Christians, Jesus found Paul and one encounter with the living Jesus changed everything for Paul, everything for him. And friends, let me tell you what that tells me. It tells me you can't go any place where Jesus is not. Your addiction is not too great. Your marriage is not too broken. Your life is not too much a mess. You know, a lot of people say, my life just looks like a pile of dirt. Well, good news, the breath of God takes piles of dirt and makes them life again. This is what our God does. And today he wants to do it for you. And today, friend, the beauty of Easter is this. Confirms his identity, cancels sin's penalty, and third, Easter is more than just information, my friends. A lot of you are just like, yeah, I'm gonna go listen to the guy do his thing and talk, and I'm gonna go home and have some ham, Easter egg hunt, and some cupcakes, because there's no calories on holidays. It's in the Bible. (laughs) (laughs) But here's the deal, friends. You will not truly understand Easter until you understand it's not just information. It's not just information, friend. Easter is invitation. I see some of you guys in here. You're like, oh, this guy's a little uncomfortable, a little more energy than I was ready for. <laughs> it's okay. I'm like this every week, I promise. I'm not angry, I'm Italian. That's how we talk. <laughs> like, oh, I'm not used to this. This doesn't feel good. I thought he was going to be quiet. <laughs> Friends, you have to understand that Christ stands at the door of your heart right now and he knocks. He's inviting you, inviting you right now. Easter is not just information, it's invitation to celebrate life eternally. You see, beloved, the statistics on death are staggering. One in every one person dies. Every single one of us Every one of us will one day stand at death's door. And on the other side of death is heaven or hell. And friends, heaven is real and hell is real. And eternity is a long time. And the reason why I love the fact that Easter is an invitation to you today It's you're invited to not one day live eternally. Easter's message is right here, right now, you can start living as though heaven is real and experiencing heaven on this side of eternity today. But friends, you gotta make that decision for yourself. Last Easter, I had a conversation with a guy. It was an awesome conversation who, during the baptismal time, I always, and I'm gonna do it right, I'm gonna tell you right now. If you came to church and you wanna get baptized today, I don't care if you've taken the class. You can be baptized and celebrate life eternally today. You're like, well, I came in my nice clothes. I got clothes you could change into. I got towels. I got everything you need. No excuses. Come to baptism's water. Be first, because the water gets dirty. Good job coming to first service. This guy came up to me and said, Mike, every single year I kept telling myself, I'm going to do it next year, man. I'm going to do it next year. I'm going to do it once I have my life together. I'm going to do it once I get my ducks in a row. But he looked at me with tears in his eyes and he was here last night and he said, I'm done waiting, man. I can't do this on my own. And that night, that that gentleman, after everyone else had already been baptized, he came storming forward in his jeans. He took off his shoes and he jumps in the baptism's water and he saw the dirt and grime of sin fall off of him and he experienced in that moment eternal life. And friend, there's an invitation in front of every single one of you right now to do the same. A bunch of us have already done it. Our kids have taken the class to to proclaim deaths and resurrection of Jesus Christ and say they want to publicly declare it. Baptism is the public declaration of faith in Jesus Christ. And if today 
you're ready to be baptized, I wanna invite you into that reality. If you signed up to be baptized today, I wanna encourage you to make your way down to the right or the left, wherever they told you to go. We're about to go into our time of baptism. But I wanna ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads with me right now. We're gonna talk to the Lord. And I wanna ask you right now to do some inventory of your heart. Do you know Jesus today? Are you confident that if you were to die today that you would spend eternity with him? And if today you're ready or not even ready, just willing to rededicate or put your faith in Jesus for the first time, I'm gonna ask you not to wait. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand up and look at me. If God's working on your heart and you're ready to put your faith in Jesus or rededicate yourself to him, raise your hand up and look at me right now and we'll talk to God together. Come on, do that right now. Praise the Lord. I see that, sister. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Way to go. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Don't mess with this, friends. This is real. If this is you, raise your hand up. Make sure I see you. Praise the Lord. And we'll just pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, today I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that what you did on Calvary's Hill was for me. And I confess you, Lord, as my Lord and Savior today. And I'm ready to experience what new life in Christ feels like. I've tried it all on my own. Now I'm going to you, Jesus. We love you. We honor you today. And all of God's children said together. Can we celebrate new life in Christ? I hope you enjoyed the message today. I wanna to encourage you to go ahead and to share it with your friends and your family. I also wanna thank you for all that you do for your part of the ministry at Sage Hills Church. Whether you partner with us through prayer or serving, giving financially, or even sharing the message, thank you for making what we do possible. God bless you.